I was sitting right over there, and somebody was up here preaching, and, was all, and I just started looking down at the Bible, and I got to talking a little bit, and um, if, you're, if you did like me, you started over in Genesis on New Year's Day uh, to read the Bible through in 1999. How many of you did that? Raise your hand. Amen. hope everybody did. It's still not too late. It's only the third. Today's the third, so you can, you can read four chapters a day starting right now and read your Bible through in 1999 and miss several days in case of emergency or something. So uh, start over. And I did that, and we got to talking about something. I forgot what it was. And I got to talking about the law of first mention. There is in the Bible what we call the law of first mention. The Bible is the most amazing book in the world. Uh, there ain't no book like this book. And uh, <clears throat> I got to flipping through it over here the other night. And I thought, well, I'll just look and see what this says. And I look. I said, I'll just look and see what that says. And I look. I'm not, I don't know if there's anything to what I'm getting ready to show you or not. But uh, I pay attention to what the Lord gives me while I'm at prayer meeting. Pay attention to it. When you're in the Spirit, you know, and praying and with a bunch of people preaching and praying, it, it pays to pay attention to thoughts pop through your head. <clears throat> so, uh, I'd like to do that this morning, just to set the precedent, let's open to Genesis 14, Genesis 14, there are a lot of what we call first mentions in the Bible, and the number system in the King James Bible is amazing. It sets the tone for, for history. There are certain numbers that we automatically associate with bad things. For example, somebody tell me what the most unlucky number is out, out in the world. Thirteen. Out, for years and years and years, there was no thirteenth floor on the hospital. There was no thirteenth gate at the airport. And still, a lot of times they're not. And a lot of people say, oh, that's a bunch of bull, I'm not superstitious. It's got nothing to do with being superstitious. It comes from the Bible. That stuff comes from the Bible. There is something fishy about the number 13. And if you want to know what it's connected with, you'll look at the first time it's mentioned. And the first time the number 13 is mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis 14, and it says in verse 4, look at it in verse 4, Genesis 14, 4, it says, Twelve years they served Cheddar or Lamer, and in the thirteenth year they what? Rebel. In the thirteenth year they what? They rebel. So the number 13 starts off in the Bible as a sign and a number of rebellion. And, and that's all the way through. If you take out your dollar bill, the dollar bill has those 13, uh, and you know, the eagle with them arrows in his hand, 13 of them, 13 stars, 13 stripes of the original colonies, 13, uh, 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 all the way down through history, the number 13 has stood for rebellion. And it shows you that in the Bible. You say, well, I don't believe in that preacher, I believe it's just coincidence. There is no way in the world you could read your Bible and possibly miss the significance of the number seven. There's no way. It's God. God has to be a mathematical God and work on a number system. Some of them are not as clear as others. But the number 13 stands for rebellion. That's when a kid gets 13, you have to beat it to death. Nearly to keep it in line, something changes. Little boys want to play with snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. And all of a sudden when they get 13, they start liking girls. And there's a lot of them a lot of the time before then. But something changes when they get to that age. Uh, they, they, get, they call that re rebellious teenage years. Starts out with the number 13. Now, I ain't got time to go into all that. I got a lot of notes in my other Bible about all the things about the number 13. Let me show you another one. Turn to Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 21. Somebody mentioned this the other night. I don't know if you've ever seen this or not. Uh, but here in Numbers chapter 21. Let's see. I'll have to find it here. Um, 
I believe it's Numbers 21, maybe it's 22. And it's the first time the word beer, the word beer is mentioned in the Bible. Can somebody find that for me? I didn't really look it up. Somebody got it? 2116? Yeah, I thought it was 21. 2116. There you go. Look at that. And Numbers 2116 says, And from thence they went to beer. And what does that word mean? That is the well. That is the well. That word beer is associated with drinking. And it's associated with drinking a lot. Somebody said, Oh, so-and-so, he could drink a well dry. That's where that word got its meaning. Is from a well. The word beer. The word beer is a no good word. Amen. The word beer is a dirty word. We ought to teach our kids that the word beer is a cuss word. Amen. It's a, it's a four letter cuss word. The word beer. Amen. Kids, say amen. amen. Lord have mercy y'all. You don't believe in drinking beer, do you? We ought to teach all these kids here that beer is a nasty, beer is a loathsome, beer is a low down, beer is a wicked thing. And the first time it's mentioned, it's talking about drinking a well. It ain't right to drink beer. It's not right to take a sip. It's not right to take a guzzle. It ain't right to take a drop. It is a no good drink that'll turn you into a slobbering, staggering bum that won't provide for your family and do wrong. Amen? That's the law of first mention. Now let's go back to Genesis 1 just a second. And I want to uh, just name you off a few things here. And I'm not going to really preach a sermon. Just name off a few of these things that I noticed the other night. And I didn't really take time to prepare a message on it because I didn't decide to really preach on it till just this morning when I got here. Or before I got here. Genesis chapter number 1. What I like to do is point out the first few words of these first few chapters in Genesis. Now remember, when Moses wrote Genesis, it's just like on a scroll. Hebrew. And uh, M. Hebrew, does Hebrew go backwards? Is that right? Educated guys. Is that right? Brother? Hebrew goes backwards. Start right and go this way. Now like that. When Moses wrote that, he was writing his, the book of Genesis and it's in one big long scroll. you got to remember, there were no chapters. There were no verses. When the Bible was originally written on scrolls, the men of God just wrote it as God gave it to them. And there was no uh, chapter 4 chapter 5, verse so and so. And that's another reason why your King James Bible is superior to what they had even in the Old Testament because uh, they couldn't just say, turn to Exodus 42. Something. Man, they'd have to look a half a day for something. If they was looking up to all them scrolls, reading for hours, trying to find a verse of Scripture. And the, the Psalms were divided up. Because you caught that quoted in the in the New Testament, it said he said in the second psalm. So they were psalm, the psalms were divided up, but the average books in the Bible were not divided up at all. So what we're getting ready to see here is just you can call it coincidence, or you can call it divine uh, inspiration. I believe it's divinely inspired, and I do believe this. I don't believe the men who inspire who who who. Translated the King James Bible were divine. I don't believe they were infallible. I don't believe they were sinless. And that's why that uh, no fool believes that. That's why that it took uh, uh, so many of them. A man can't produce a perfect work. But God can use a man to do a little bit. God can use another man to do a little bit. God can use another man to do a little bit. And when it's all come together, God's got His hand on it. And that's what He done in the King James Bible. That's what He did. His hand is on it. And I believe this morning, with all my heart, that the chapter and verse markings in the King James Bible are just exactly where God Almighty wanted them to be. The verses are where they wanted them to be. And the italicized words are right where God wanted them to be. And God put His approval on them. What happened is when He got it all together, God stamped it and said, That's my word. So I thought the other night when I was up here, I thought, I believe I'll just look. This is new beginning. This is the beginning of the new year. You know, one represents God. 
Two represents division. Three represents the Trinity and so forth and so on. Four, the world. And five, grace or death, depending on which preacher you believe. And six represents uh, the, the number of man. Seven represents, I believe it's death, by the way. Uh, seven represents completion. Eight represents new beginning. Nine represents uh, uh, the fruits of the Spirit or judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. Ten represents the Gentile nation. And then 11, 12, Israel. On up to forty tri- uh, trials and tribulation, and and thirteen rebellion, and you can go on and on and on. Lord, they got meanings for every number there is. Some of them I'm not too sure about, but some of them are very clear from the Word of God. So let's look here as we begin the new year. Let's look way back in the first book of the Bible and see how God began. See how God began. There, we're starting out a new beginning, new year. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. I will not read the whole verse, just the first few words to make a point. Here we go. First point, chapter 1, 1. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. That's where it all starts. That's where it all began. In the beginning, God. Amen. In the beginning, God. Capital G. Not in the beginning amoeba or tadpole. Not in the beginning uh, there was a light that shined from one side of the universe to the other and a bowl of lightning struck a mud puddle and a tadpole wiggled up and turned into a frog. It said, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. I want to say to you folks this morning that our God is from everlasting to everlasting. He never had a start. He'll never have an end. When it all began, there was God. When it all started, there was God Almighty. In the beginning, God. Now, look at chapter 2. Chapter 2 and verse 1. I have no idea why I'm getting hoarse this morning. I'm not, I don't usually do that. I think I'm sick. Uh, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1. And it starts out saying this. It starts out saying, And God... Oh, I'm sorry. Verse Genesis 2 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Point number 2. God started it all. Chapter 2. The heavens and the earth were were finished. It did not take God 10 million years to make the earth. It did not take God 10 million seconds to make the earth. He spoke the world into existence and by the first week, the first week, it was all done. Amen? We was talking to this boy last night and I was trying to witness to him. Up there at the ski slopes, went up on Beach Mountain just to see the scenery. And uh, I haven't been up there in a long time. And I took Brother Ernie up there and went up there. And this guy come flying down through there on a snowboard. And he stopped. And he stopped there. And he, he was trying to get this little girl. He was, uh, was a trainer. He was like a trainer. Training people how to ski. And uh, it was cold. Lord have mercy. The wind was blowing. I, the chill factor is probably 10 degrees, I reckon. Man, it was cold. And I didn't know this, but you know that Beach Mountain is the highest elevated town in the whole eastern half of the United States. It's higher than anything is in Pennsylvania. It's higher than anything, any town in, uh, in Tennessee or uh, Virginia or West Virginia or Kentucky. It's the highest elevated city, town in the eastern half, east, east Mississippi River. So it's up there in Lord, it mercy is cold. And, uh, this guy we got talking to him. And I was going to try to witness to him. And uh, he was a ski instructor. And I, he said, where are y'all from? We said, Marion. And we began to talk to him there a little bit. And I said, are you a Christian? Are you saved? He said, oh yes, I was an altar boy. And I was this, and he had a Yankee accent. And I said, uh, you're from up north somewhere, ain't you? He said, yeah, I'm from Rhode Island. And I began to ask him, he said, I've lived here. And I've lived in Rhode Island. He said, I've lived in Washington. Seattle, Washington, the state. He said he lived all the place. And I said, where would you rather live? He said, Seattle, Washington. He said, I said, everything's so clean there. He said, you can't throw out a piece of paper out the window because somebody blow the horn at you. And you... I thought, well, who in the world want to live in a place like that? Uh, he said, 
Uh, he said, uh, and I, I, it didn't take me long to figure out he's one of these earth worshiping people. And boy, he said, he said, I love the mountains in Washington. He said, by the way, they are the youngest mountains. Of all the other mountain ranges. They're the youngest. I thought, son, you got rocks in your head. I didn't say it, but I thought, all the mountains are the same age. They all had the same birthday. And God pushed them up and shook them around at the flood in Noah's day. When the flood went down. But there was all ever rock in this world. See that rock right there? Some of them was Christian. I don't know what that is. Uh, but uh, that's $25,000 worth right there. Just half of it. But you know what? Them things was crystallized. But everything in this planet was born when God said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And they none of it older than a, three or four days of each other. I know there's new stuff makes and mountains crust things and really like crystallize. And I know about how it drips up there in limbo caverns and makes this and makes that. I want to tell you something, brother. That first week, God had it all done and ain't nothing been created since then. Everything that's here since then is made out of something that God made that first week. Now, look at Genesis 3. You want to see what God tells us here in the beginning? Genesis 3, 1. Everybody here needs to get this. And some of you people don't think you need to get it. Needs to get it worse. Here it is. Genesis 3, 1 said, Now the serpent was more subtle than any. I'll stop right there. The serpent was more subtle than any. I said, the serpent, he's a picture of the devil. I'm telling you this morning, if you think the devil ain't smart, you are lost your mind. You ain't think the devil's got a plot laying for you, you've lost your mind. Everybody in here, there's not a person in here. When you get on this altar and you say, I'm going to win souls, I'm going to read my Bible, I'm going to pray, right then the devil, he begins to lay a plot. The devil's after every young person in here in 99. The devil's after every man to break up your home. The devil put all kinds of crazy things in your head. The devil wants to stop our bus ministry. The devil is subtle. He's subtle. That means he's slick. That means he's smart. He's crafty. You people say, boy, I believe the devil's going to do this. The devil always comes in the way you ain't looking for. Him. He'll come in a way you don't expect it. Somebody said, well, I've been expecting the devil to do this for a long time. You better watch it. Blam! This is the way he's coming at you. I've seen teenagers, and I was really worried about one teenager going out into sin. And guess what happened? The other one went out. I've seen marriages. Y'all listening to me? I've seen marriages where people said, boy, I better pray for so-and-so. He ain't been coming to church regular. I believe he's going to leave his wife and backslide. And everybody thought, and the wife's the one that run off. The serpent is subtle. He's smart. You ain't got but one weapon against the devil and it's stay close to Jesus Christ. You can't trust your flesh out that door right there. You can't live right. I can't live right without God's power and God's Spirit. Listen, you're sorry as a devil. I'm sorry as a devil. There ain't nothing good in your flesh. You better be real careful getting religious, looking down your nose at other people, saying, boy, I'm better than thou. I don't do this. I don't do that. I've never done this. You better be careful about that kind of attitude because the devil laying a plot for you, son. Say amen right there. Amen. Bible said the serpent is more subtle. Who would have thought he'd have tricked Eve into eating that fruit? If we'd have been right in the Bible, we wouldn't have made it that way. We'd have said that old wicked man, Adam, went down there and the devil showed him some kind of something or another and old Adam sinned and bring his wife right into it. Bless her heart. That's where... But he's smart. The devil comes in the way you're not looking for him. You get your teenagers and get them all going wrong, boy, he'll hit, he'll hit the in-laws. You get the in-laws straightened out and he'll hit you financially. You get your fin bills paid and he'll hit some way, some kind of problem at work. Or some... You know what? Some of you husbands and wives fuss all the time at home and you don't even know what you're fussing about. It's just a pure devil. Gets in your home. Gets in your... You know what you need to do? Quit your fussing and get down on your knees and plead the blood of Jesus. Did you hear him saying a while ago? The only thing, the only thing, the only thing between me and the flames of hell is the blood of the old rugged cross. I'm not good. You're not good. Get it through your head this morning.
nothing. There ain't nothing good about you. The devil's smart. Cling to the cross. Depend on the blood. Trust Jesus. That's your only hope for doing right. In 1999. The serpent was more subtle. But let's look at chapter 4. Let's look at chapter 4. You want to see a part of history? How did we all get here? Here it is. History. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. God told him, He said, Be fruitful and replenish the earth. Adam and Eve went out. Uh, they got married. And they began to have children. And their children, they grew up. And they began to have children. Now you got to remember that Adam was over 800 when he died. So people think people think they're so smart. They come and say, "Well, the Bible said Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, and then Cain went out and found his wife, and he found her line. Where did Cain get his wife? There wasn't nobody in the world but Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. You, you, you're." Just about retarded, buddy. He was 800 years old. A man and woman had a lot of kids in 800 years. And their kids and their grandkids and their grandkids and their grandkids, in less than 100 years, there was hundreds of people on the earth. So, uh, you know where Cain got his wife? In the land of Nod. That's down the road a little ways. Next town down. And it was one of his, I hate to say this, Cousins, <laughs> don't get no ideas in your head. It ain't. Um, God said you're not supposed to marry close kin. Amen. You know why? Because your kids will have two noses or something, and you're supposed. To, and plus, it's just there's just something wicked about it. You're not supposed to marry you. Uh, I don't know how far it goes. Maybe somebody here and tell me. You know, you ain't supposed to marry your sister. Lord help. I think anybody's sick, man. Uh, I mean. I always, I hated my sisters. <laughs> Didn't you when you was growing up? You ain't supposed to marry your sister, amen? You ain't supposed to marry your, your, your first cousin or your aunt. <laughs> That's even sick to think about, but I guess man needs to preach on it these day and time. And uh, somewhere, you know, I guess, but there wasn't nobody else. And they had cousin, 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 and he found the wife and married her. So Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and they began to sprout out all over the place, and gradually they began to come. Now, now it's real debatable how all the, the cousins and how all the colors got here. But basically, there's only three colors. There's black, there's brown, there's white. When they come out of the ark, there's only three boys on this planet. And they populated the whole world. And you've heard me teach on that. Shem would be the father of the dark, dark uh, brown skin. Uh, Straight haired people. They settled in, uh, in, uh, the, the, the east over there. That's where Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Jewish, anybody with dark skin, little bodies, non emotional, straight haired people come from Shem. Japheth would be the father of the white skin race. His, all his relatives went north and went into Russia and settled down. You can trace it all. You can trace it right in the Bible. And came from Russia. Phil's ready. That's where in English, that's where me and you come from. At least most, you know, we mostly come from there. And we're mostly white skin. And, uh, they, they're, they are, uh, they're uh, thinkers. They are inventors. Uh, but they're, they're not very religious. The, those brown skinned people are much more religious than white skin. And then Ham went south. The word Ham itself means burnt or dark, right? Went south, settled in Africa. Ham became the father of the black skinned people, dark skinned with uh, kinky hair and uh, uh, his uh, their characteristics. They are very emotional. They're, I'm not going to say, I'm not prejudiced. There's no race better than another race. God don't love one group of people more than He loves another group of people. But, number five. Look at the first few lines of this, this chapter. This is a mind blower, buddy. I love it. This is the book. This is the book. What a way to start out the new year. This is the book. We hadn't read five chapters and it said, this is the book. Amen? That's the book, ladies and gentlemen. That's the book that is the final authority. And I'll tell you, we'll be celebrating, if the Lord don't come and I'll live, we'll be celebrating our 22nd 
anniversary in just a few weeks here at New Manor Baptist Church. If the Lord don't come and we live and everything goes all right, we'll stand up here and guess what? I have not had to change books one time in 22 years. People change places, things. Well, I've changed. Our buildings have changed. I, we've all changed. But brother, the book ain't changed. It says the exact same thing it did on that first Sunday morning we had service back in 1977. As it says today, right, still right, wrong, still wrong. Heaven's up, hell's down. Jesus is still a friend of sinners. The blood's still there. This is the book. And brother, the book has not change one word and I'm thankful to God that we still got the same book that we started out with. Amen. This is the book. You say, well, Brother Danny, right, we better get us something new for the new millennium. Nope. We've got the book. We've got the book. This is the book. And by the way, I want to say this. And I'm going to hush here in a minute. Do you know what? Whatever that book says, that's it. As far as our church is concerned. Book says it. If I say something, if I do something, if I say something, and the Bible says something else, I'm wrong, the Bible's right. Brother Bruce says one thing, the Bible says something else, Brother Bruce is wrong, the, the Bible's right. If your grandma seen 15 angels in her bedroom and had dreams all night long and floated to heaven and, and uh, wrote scrolls and, and taught Mother Teresa a few tricks, and she says one thing, and the Bible says something else, Granny's wrong. The Bible's right. My mom's wrong. The Bible's right. Your daddy's wrong. The Bible's right. My wife's wrong. The Bible's right. My kids is wrong. The Bible's right. Mother Danny's an idiot. The Bible's right. Yay! Let God be true and everybody else a liar. Right here is the final authority. Amen? Let's get any more right quick and I'm through. Chapter 6. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass. Boy, that's a great one, ain't it? And it came to pass. Glory to God. Two ways to look at that. First way is it's fun, but it's the wrong way to look at it, but it's fun anyway. You know, they wrote that song, It didn't come to stay, it came to pass. That's a good song. And every, every trouble you're going through, it didn't come to stay, it came to pass. It, it came to pass. Amen. You say, Lordy mercy, Brother Danny, I'm having it so hard. I'm going through the most difficult time in my life. I, I'm going through divorce, or I'm going through this, or that. And there's several of you in here. Listen, if you'll let that thing, it'll make you a better person. You know what? We had about 15 men up here praying the other night. And about 12 of them had been through a divorce or a terrible time in life. What does that tell you? You know what that tells you? That tells you that a lot of people ain't never had much trouble. Don't appreciate God as much as somebody who's been through the fire. And I'm not, I'm not fussing at you if you ain't had that trouble. I'm not saying you don't love God. I'm just saying the darker valley you go through, the more it makes you appreciate what the Lord's done for you. You'll do it. You'll do it. You lose a loved one. You know what people do when somebody has trouble, uh, lose a kid or somebody die in the family? They get close to God. Came to pass for him. Came to pass. It came to pass. And the other way of looking at it is that it came to pass the other way. You know, if God said it, it's going to happen. And it came to pass. I never read in the Bible where it said, and it didn't come to pass. It always says that a million times. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. No matter what it said, sooner or later, and it came to pass. You know what that tells me? That tells me that all the rest of that stuff's going to come to pass. Jesus really is going to come back. Now, can I, can I do something without y'all fussing at me? I'm, we're in 1999. I'm going to milk it for everything it's worth. Don't y'all get wore out with me if I keep harping on the signs of the times and everything. I don't know if the Lord's coming back or not, but I'm going to harp on it and harp on it. and harp. I'm going to take advantage of us being in the last year. Of the month. I'm thinking about using that as a theme for the youth rally. I really am. Man, we could have awful signs of the times. and uh, Listen, this has never happened before. We've never lived to see the end of a generation or, or the, even a millennium, Lord in mercy, let alone the sixth millennium, 2,000 years after Jesus comes. We may go right on into 2000, 2001 and nothing happened. That might happen. I'm not a prophet, but buddy, I'm going to be, I'm going to scare everybody I can with it. Amen? Hey, when that guy wrote that book, 
on Jesus coming back. I didn't really believe Jesus coming back, but I said He might, bless God. He might, and He might. He might come back this year. This might be the end. I know people, there was people who got saved off that thing and are still saved now because they got scared the Lord is coming back. Let's scare the devil out of them. Amen? Can't you pass. Alright, chapter 7. God drowned the world there. They're getting ready to, but chapter 7. Completion, chapter 7. Noah didn't, I mean, Moses didn't even know he was going to have chapters when he wrote it. I doubt if he even knew it was going to be in a book. And the Lord said unto Noah, and the Lord said unto Noah. That means God spoke to Noah and said, Get out of here, I'm going. And Noah got in there. And buddy, the flood came and wiped the whole world away. And I'll give you the last thing I'm through. Seven stand for completion. Completed that first age there. And then chapter 8, verse 1, the flood's over. The water's going down. And look what God said. Chapter 8, verse 1. And God remembered Noah. Boy, that's a blessing to me. Thank God He remembered. He didn't forget His young ones. In wrath, in tribulation, in terrible times, when the water went over top of the mountains, God didn't forget His young ones. Bible said God remembered Noah. He said, I've got a family down there that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I'm going to bring them through. I'm going to get them out. Listen, God ain't forgot us. We might be drowning in this old sin-cursed pornographic internet of a mess we're in. We might be drowning in filth for this world. Drinking, cussing, rocking, rolling. Boom. Do you know right now? Do you know right now? There's probably about ten rock songs being played in this room. All you got to do is turn on FM radio. You can pick it up. It's going through here. There's pornography channels going through here. That might be why it's so hard for people to do right now. All that stuff may have some kind of effect on you. I don't know. It's going through your head, through your body right now. Playboy channels, wicked stuff, all kinds of rock and roll. It's in the air everywhere. It's like we're buried underneath a load of filth. But God remembered Noah. And I'm going to say this morning, God ain't forgot us. God ain't forgot about His young'uns. God's promises are still true. God's still on the throne. He's not forgot us. Noah's wife, Noah's wife might have come through there and she said, I can't stand this no more. I'm leaving you, Noah. And he said, you better know how to swim good, honey, if you're leaving me. And she said, well, I'll go to the other side of the ark and not speak to you for another month. He said, well... I love you. And she went over there and, and maybe Noah got mad at her. I don't know. Maybe she and Hammond Jason said, I hate this. God ain't never going to... It's been out here a year. There's in that ark a year, man. The water was up a year. Finally went up. And I want to tell you what. God remembered Noah. And I want to say this morning, God remembers new manna. God remembers you. God remembered them. You know what He done? In chapter 8, I'm not, you got to come out and start a new world. New beginning. Start all over again. You better watch it. When God says something, every chapter, every line, every verse in that book is to show you how to start. And I thought since we're starting out a new year this morning, y'all write it down now. And keep in Sunday school. Don't miss a Sunday this year. Okay? Don't miss a Sunday this year. If it snows, we'll come call me and we'll come get you. I'm just looking for an excuse to get out. We just went up the mountains last night just to get out in it. Man, it was a blast. Seen that guy, the hitchhiker I was telling you about we picked up down the street here. I was driving down through there and man, it was... My first thought was, splashy. <laughs> that was the flesh. Because <laughs> when you hit, <laughs> you hit them things last night, every time we hit them, you just go, Psh, spray a big thing. Well, I could have killed that guy. But my second thought, no, that ain't right. Um, I picked him up and we witnessed to him. <laughs> he was a young man on alcohol. And he said, two people from our church have been trying to get him to come. So let's pray for that boy. Would you do that? Pray for him. His name is Scott. We took him down to Nebo last night. Had prayer with him. 11.30 last night. They come up here at the radio station about 11.30 last night. And... Uh, Let's do that. We got a new start. Thank God we got a new start. You think the devil's quit? You better think again. The old saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet.
No telling what we're liable to see this year. But let's do it right. Amen. Let's stand.